uh, we talked about uh, recommender systems uh, last time um, and I presented uh, two algorithms uh, both from the class of collaborative filtering uh, mechanisms um, and the first was the uh, user-based algorithm uh, both are um, based on such an interaction matrix. Such an interaction matrix, uh, for example, the semantics of such a matrix could be um, here we have the consumers and here we have the products and a one uh, in some position means that, for example, here uh, product number three was purchased by uh, consumer number four. Huh? Uh, and a zero means uh, the respective consumer didn't buy uh, that product. But this is just one possible interpretation. We could also fill this matrix not just binary but with um, positive numbers between zero and five corresponding to a star rating that the consumers gave to the products. And then the whole algorithm also works on this. Okay, um, yeah, and the, uh, the, these are collaborative filtering algorithms because the recommendations, for example, for customer four we get finally um, come from what all the other consumers did. So it's a collaboration of consumers. Yeah? Um, and in the user-based algorithm, the whole thing is, uh, relies on this matrix, the consumer similarity matrix. Um, and you see in the diagonal you have all ones. And that means every consumer is perfectly similar to himself. Huh? Um, and uh, yeah, for example, here we have a 0, 0 0.15, 0 0.62. This is similarities between consumers. And here you can be creative. You can invent your own similarity measure between uh, two consumers. I mean, what I used, and this is quite obvious, um, I computed the correlation coefficients between the respective customers. And now, um, I mean, here we have the formula for the correlation coefficient. Um, and then the whole algorithm is extremely simple. We just multiply the consumer similarity matrix with uh, this matrix A. And what we get here are the recommendation scores. So again, here we have the products and here we have the consumers. And uh, now if I look at a certain consumer, for example, number one, I just take the maximum in this row and this is the preferred product uh, for this customer and the second largest uh, maybe if we want to recommend two products, then we would recommend the, the red one and the blue one in the order red and then blue. Yeah? So that's extremely simple and it works fairly well. Um, and the, the next algorithm uh, is the item-based algorithm. Here we compute correlation coefficients between products. So we have a product similarity matrix and then again we multiply A times this similarity matrix, but now, of course, from the other side, um, and we get recommendation scores. And if you compare these two recommendation matrices, I mean, there is some relation. For example, um, among these five elements here are the, the highest or the second highest scores. And this was in the previous matrix, too. OK, yes. Um, now, these algorithms are based on such a similarity matrix. So I have to invent 
or yeah, I have to know or have, I need to have an idea about how to calculate the similarity between two consumers or between two products. Yeah? And of course the result depends on the similarity function I use here. Um, and now I show you a different algorithm, uh, the link analysis algorithm, and in this algorithm we do use something like such a similarity matrix too, but we don't have to specify the matrix. This matrix evolves, it just evolves. Yeah? We start with some initial values and, and then it dynamically during the iteration process evolves. And that's of course a nice feature. And in this paper which I cited, look where was it? Oh no, sorry. Ah, it comes, uh, it comes right here. Yeah. In this paper, oh, I, I promised to send it to you by email, but I didn't do it yet. Yes. So I'll try to do it today. No, not today. Today I'm really busy, but tomorrow. And you can, of course, remind me. <laughs> um, in this paper, they compare different uh, collaborative filtering algorithms. And the link analysis algorithm is among the best of these algorithms. Okay, and the view is, yeah, maybe a little bit different, but I mean, you can, you can always have this, this view. So here we have the consumers. For each one of the consumers, we have one node. And for each product, we have one node. And then we have links between consumers and products. And these links, they finally uh, describe the relation between consumer and product. Um, and in such a matrix A, for example, A to 4 is the link between consumer 2 and product 4. Yeah. <coughs> And I mean, this is again uh, um, the, the A matrix we had before. This A matrix, look here. This, is, this matrix contains links between consumers and products. Consumer 4 has a link to product 1, but no link to product 2. Huh? Um, oh, well, in, in graph theory, this matrix is called the adjacency matrix, yes. So uh, consumer 7 is a neighbor of product 2. So they are, they are adjacent, yeah. Uh, so you see it's just a different view of the same thing. And of course these links, they may be binary, either there is a link or there is no link, or they may be weighted um, and, and then uh, this could uh, represent a star rating. Okay, and now let's uh, look at the idea of these algorithms. We introduced two matrices. The first is, they call it the consumer representativeness matrix. I mean, we could, we could also call it consumer similarity matrix. Huh? Uh, representativeness means, look, the indice, if I look at one matrix element, the CRIJ, then this means consumer J's representativeness score for consumer I. So it tells us, is the, the, um, are the shop, is the shopping behavior of consumer I representative for the shopping behavior of consumer J? So this is actually the similarity of these customers. So this matrix is uh, closely related to the consumer similarity matrix. Okay, and then here we have the product representativeness matrix. And now here you have to be a little bit careful. Look, here we had a M by M matrix, and now we have a N 
times m matrix. Yeah? So this is a square matrix. Um, correlation between consumer and consumer. But here we have correlation between product and consumer. So PRIJ is product J's representativeness core for consumer I. Yeah? Okay. Um, and now we can write down some simple equations. For example, CR is A times PR. Yeah? Um, I mean, A, well, look, um, yeah, PR is a N times M matrix. A is just uh, kind of transposed. It's M times N matrix. And now if I multiply A times PR, I get a square matrix as a result, which is CR, which is a M times N, M times M matrix. Yeah? Um, and now, I mean, we don't know these matrices yet. We don't know them yet. What we know is A. A is determined by the shopping behavior of our consumers. But we do not know CR and PR. That's the point. We want to determine these matrices. So we don't know how similar these customers are, but from their shopping behavior, we may derive how similar these guys are. Okay? So now this is our first equation. And remember, we don't know CR and PR yet. Huh? We, want to we want to determine them. Okay, and now on the other hand, we can of course we can write this equation. PR is A transposed times CR. Yeah. yeah. I mean this, yeah, this is obvious. If this is a square matrix, if I take this square matrix and multiply from the left the transpose of this matrix A, I get um, a non-square matrix PR, which actually if, uh, yeah, if A is an M times N matrix, then PR is an N times M matrix. So formally this is correct and it corresponds to this. And remember, we don't know uh, PR and CR yet. So this is just, I mean, kind of a formal writing. Uh, but now I can uh, substitute this PR here. And then we get CR is e equal to A times A transpose times CR. And now look what we have here is a recursive equation. Uh, kind of a fixed point equation. And now we can do fixed point iteration on this. So we start with some, initially, with some matrix CR. Uh, and what they recommend in the paper is to use the identity matrix. Uh, I mean, remember, it's the consumer representative matrix. So what we know initially is that every consumer is representative for himself or herself. I mean, that's basic, that's trivial. So uh, maybe that's the reason why they start with the identity matrix. And then we do fixed point iteration. So CR at the next time step is A times A transpose times uh, the previous CR. That's it. I mean, that's really basic. But this is not yet the full algorithm. This is the idea. That's just to explain the idea of the algorithm, because now we need some minor refinements. And don't ask me why they did this. Um, I didn't go into all the details of the algorithm and analyze it. I just read the paper, and they argued that we need, one needs some normalization. Oh, yes. The, I mean, I guess the major reason is 
if you would just apply this iteration, it would diverge. The values would become larger and larger. And uh, the, the underlying reason, I mean, we had fixed point iteration in the math lecture, and you know, uh, you need to have a contraction. So this mapping, this mapping, this function here that maps the old CR on the new CR uh, must be such that the values in this new matrix are kind of smaller uh, than the values in the old matrix. Or, I mean, we could talk about the matrix norm. The matrix norm of this matrix uh, should not be uh, greater than the matrix norm of the original matrix. Uh, um, and uh, this would not hold here. And therefore, they introduce two normalization steps into the algorithm, and then it works. I mean, I tried it, it really works. Uh, um, okay, and now look at the, uh, the algorithm. Uh, <coughs> yeah. I mean, we do have this interaction matrix in the beginning, and now we first normalize the interaction matrix. That's the first normalization step, and we define a new matrix B uh, with the property that Bij is equal to Aij divided by, and look what, what this is, the sum over J of Aij. So this is the sum of all the matrix elements in one row. Yeah? And um, maybe you remember from, from the math lecture, what is the matrix norm? What is the norm of the matrix? Who remembers? It is the maximum of the sum of all the absolute values of all the rows in the matrix. Yeah? And now, if we divide um, in each row by the sum of all the, uh, the elements, that's kind of a normalization of the matrix such that the matrix norm um, is I mean, if we would use the absolute values here, oh, actually, A is, everything is positive, so we don't need to use absolute values. Huh? Yeah, so we, we, uh, we finally normalize the whole matrix. Okay, but now there is a modification. We have this exponent gamma. Without the exponent gamma, this would be a perfect normalization of the matrix. Huh? Um, okay. Um, and then there is this exponent gamma. I don't know why they introduced this. Um, yeah, I guess there is some argument in the paper. I don't remember. Yeah. I mean, this gamma, um, they recommend to use values smaller than 1, like 0.9 or something like that. Um, yeah, and as the initial consumer representative matrix, CR of zero, I said use the identity matrix, and what they do is they multiply the identity matrix with some constant factor eta. So we have two parameters, eta and gamma, but in my experiments, I also applied this algorithm. I always used eta equal one, which worked well. Yeah? So you, it looks like you could omit this parameter eta. Okay, and now comes the algorithm, which is basically what we have seen on the slide before. Uh, um, yeah, kind of similar. So the, there is this first step where uh, from CR t minus 1, we calculate PR of t. Uh, if we go back, yeah. PR is A transpose times CR. And now we get PR is A transpose times CR. Uh, that's the same formula we had. And now, let's go back, CR is A times PR. And now, CR is B times PR. 
So we don't use A, we use the normalized A, which is B, yeah, to compute CR. And if you take these two steps together, then we have this um, formula we had before. Look, CR of T is equal to B times. And now we replace this PR here uh, times A transpose times CR of T minus 1. Yeah. And if we compare this to what we had there, look, this is exactly the same formula, just that we use the normalized A. Okay, so this is the iteration procedure. And now after each one iteration, we normalize our CR. Uh, so this is a second normalization. CRIJ is CRIJ divided by the sum over I CRIJ. And now if you compare this normalization with this, you see the difference. Here we take the sum over one row, and here we take the sum over a column. Uh, Okay, yeah, and here uh, we have again a kind of a mod modification. So this final CR of T we get from this here and this, um, we, we just add CR of zero, which is the identity matrix. So in each step after the, uh, the update, we add the, uh, the, this modified identity matrix to our matrix CR. So it's not too difficult. It's really easy to implement. Huh? And I mean, here you see, this is the complete octave program uh, for this algorithm. Huh? So it's quite short. It just fits on one slide. But I mean, we don't go into the details of the code here. Huh? Um, we rather look at the results. So our inter the same interaction matrix again, and this is our product representativeness matrix. And you see again, we have these similarities in this column. We have uh, the maximum values here and here. And if we relate this to the previous matrices, it's quite similar. Huh? I mean, I didn't do an empirical evaluation. They did this in this paper, and they showed that the link analysis algorithm is uh, quite a good algorithm. Okay, yeah, so we are now finished uh, with the collab collaborative filtering. Of course, I just uh, th showed uh, three algorithms. I mean, nowadays there are, exist uh, lots of algorithms, many modifications and many different schemes. Uh, in this paper, I guess they present five or six algorithms. Um, yeah. Do you have questions about the collaborative filtering? Okay, and now we, we go a little bit, only a very little bit into content-based filtering because content-based filtering is a huge area. I mean, it's actually, it's AI. Yeah? You could use so many uh, techniques from AI and uh, as soon as you dive into the content-based filtering, it may become quite uh, challenging and difficult. Okay, uh, now what is the difference? Oh, maybe we start with an application. Uh, we look into the Yakadu project. Um, this was actually a very nice project I had about two years ago. And Marius Abel, this guy here in the last row, he was uh, the person to implement all this. And he did a, an excellent job in this project. But now, let me uh, talk about this project. Um, there were uh, 
three um, um, three people. Um, what is uh, from from economics? Yeah? Uh, and they they just founded a company called Yakadu, and their idea was to replace the classical salesperson in the store. Uh, so they, uh, when you look at online shops, when you do um, online shopping like at Amazon or at some electronic store online, then of course it may be cheaper, it's much easier to order something, you have it maybe the next day, everything's very nice, but the downside of the whole thing is there is no salesperson who could uh, help you selecting the product that fits your, uh, um, your preferences very well. That's the, the real problem. So online shopping up to now in most of the stores is something for experts. Huh? Suppose maybe your girlfriend wants to buy a computer and she, and she goes into the online store. I mean, there is uh, so much, of, so many offers, no chance to find the right thing for her. Of course, she comes to you and asks you what computer should I buy and you would buy it for her. But if she wouldn't have such a boyfriend, uh, she, she, she would maybe, I guess, go to MediaMarkt and ask somebody there. Huh? Uh, but I, you read it in the newspaper from today on. Uh, Media Markt also has his online store, and maybe, <laughs> maybe it's not worse than if you go to the real Media Markt. <laughs> um, yeah, and and the idea of these uh, uh, three people was um, to have an online store with. A, virtual salesperson that helps you uh, selecting the, the appropriate product. And this is what we call content-based filtering. Huh? Why? When you enter this online store, then the idea is that this virtual salesperson recommends you a product that fits your needs. Huh? So it's just about the contents. You specify what you want, as it is if you go, I mean, we did this for digital cameras. Huh? When you enter such a store where you can purchase digital cameras, and then a classical salesperson would first talk to you and ask you some questions. There would be kind of an interview. The salesperson would, as a first question, ask you, was möchten Sie mit Ihrer Kamera aufnehmen? So, what kind of pictures do you want to take with this camera? Huh? And then here you can select among four, I mean, this is just the first prototype. Maybe at a final version there would be six or eight selections. Here you could uh, select landscapes, close-ups, um, long distance uh, photographs, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this picture should actually be replaced, uh, Marius. I guess maybe it, it should be an, like an, an, an animal, an eagle, uh, which you uh, uh, take a photograph with the, the, the zoom objective. And this is portraits. Huh? And then depending on your selection, this is the first, the first feature on which the recommendation will depend. And then maybe the next question is uh, about size and weight of the camera. Um, and the third, uh, oh yeah, and uh, I mean, I just took two, two slides and two features out of, I, I don't know, maybe we had five or six or seven features. And finally, uh, the recommender system recommends your camera and actually here you get uh, three recommendations um, with uh, an associated score. Uh, these uh, three cameras, they all have a similar score, 95.79%, all around 95%. And here you have a table of uh, the 
most important features of the cameras and highlighted in red are those features where the cameras differ. Yeah? Um, okay, yeah. And now the question is how could one implement such a recommender system? Yeah? Um, now, uh, the recommender system is nothing but a function that maps a set of input features F1 through Fn onto, let's call it a, a score. Huh? These input features, they come from the customer. Huh? Or, I mean, they come from the interview. Huh? Um, and then this black box should output a score for all the products. Huh? Um, and then these scores will be sorted and maybe the three products with the highest scores will be recommended to the customer. And now, of course, the question is how do we fill this black box uh, with an, uh, an algorithm? Huh? And there are so many ways. I mean, we could use machine learning techniques, whatever. Uh, what we did in Yakadu is we um, used the simplest algorithm you already know, um, which is the nearest neighbor algorithm. Huh? Um, yeah. So this is what we call nearest neighbor filtering. Um, so we have this, oh, here it's called T, a target feature vector from the customer. Yeah, I mean, that's from the customer interview. So these are the training data. We want to train uh, this, uh, this function. Yeah, if we would use a supervised learning uh, algorithm, we would have a training process. But as you remember, when we do nearest neighbor, then during the the learning phase, we do nothing. We just store our training data in a file. Huh? And these are our training feature vectors from the customer interview. Um, yes. And now, of course, the question is, how do we, how do we map these guys onto scores? That's the problem. That's actually the problem. Now, if we would do, we would apply the classical nearest neighbor algorithm, then as a training data, we would need our feature vector together with the score. So there should be some human trainer that um, inserts the labels in, into our training data file. So the file would look like F11 through F, um, let's see, yeah, 1N, um, and then F2, 1 to F2, N, and so on. So these are, from many customer interviews, the feature values. Huh? I mean, this first index just counts the, the item number here, and then we would need, um, no matter whether we use nearest neighbor or some uh, eager learning algorithm, we would of course need this cause, S1, S2, and so on. If we do supervised learning, we need to have these labels in our training file. And now, this is not easy. This is not easy. I mean, we would, we would need to ask the trainer, and this trainer would be some camera expert, to give us a score uh, here, and a score here, and so on. And this is kind of difficult. And that's why we decided to do something much simpler. We just we just store, so we, we do not have these scores for training. We only have these feature vectors. 
Um, oh, yes, and of course, um, let me see. What did we do during learning? We store the feature vectors of all our products. Uh, for every product, let, uh, let's look back. Here. These are the features. First, we have the price in euro. Um, I look at product number one. This camera has this feature vector, 230 euro. Uh, three inch display, 174 gram weight. The minimum, uh, what is Brennweite? Focal length, yeah, yeah. Minimum focal length, maximum focal length. Um, is it suited for portrait pictures? Has it uh, manual uh, exposure control? These are the features of camera number one. These are the features of camera number two and so on. And that's what we store here. We just store for all the cameras the features and then we associate with each one of the feature vectors the identity of the camera. So here we have camera one, camera two and so on. I mean that's really extremely simple. We just store all the products together with their feature vector. And now comes the customer and goes through the interview and after the interview we have extracted the feature vector um, of this, this customer's needs. And now what we do is we do a nearest neighbor search. So in the database, we look for that feature vector which is closest to uh, the one of the customer. And then we compute um, the distance and the score is, I don't remember the formula, kind of the inverse distance. Yeah? And that's it. I mean, it's extremely simple. But it works quite well. Now, Marius, what did I forget about our algorithm? Yeah, we did some enhancements with the algorithm um, concerning deviations of features because um, a cheaper price should not have a negative effect on the distance. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A cheaper. Oh, yes. So if, for example, there is the question what is the price region the customer uh, wants to... I mean, that typically in many stores is the first question. How much money would you spend? And then if the customer says 250 euro, and now suppose there is a product which perfectly fits all the needs, but, but which is much cheaper, then uh, if you just look at the distance, then this product would have a large distance and it would not be recommended. And this, of course, doesn't make much sense. Huh? Uh, so I, I guess mo most of the customers would be happy to get a cheaper product which perfectly fits their needs. And, and, and here, so here he did some modifications in the, in the nearest neighbor function. Yeah, what else? Ah, yeah, okay. So, so if, if one of these feature values is unknown from the customer, then we need to use a modified uh, distance function because, I mean, if we just would use the Euclidean distance, then the, uh, the, the simplest idea would be to, use, to do it in a space which has um, uh, a smaller dimension but then, of course, the values wouldn't be comparable anymore. Or, oh, I mean, we could do it with all the, with all the products on the lower dimensional space. That's what we did. Okay. Yeah. What else? That's it. Okay. Yeah. So this is the simplest algorithm for content-based filtering. 
Um, now, um, yeah, let me see. Yeah, so the, the formula, in order to determine the recommended product, we just look for, in our training data, for that product which has the minimum distance to our feature vector of the query. Yeah? And this comes from the argmin function. So this argmin loops over all the products in our database and finally we get the best suited product or maybe more than one well suited product. And so for this distance function, the distance between our target feature vector and all the products, we could of course use the Euclidean distance. And I mean, when we talked about, I guess it was in the chapter on clustering, yes, we compared a number of distance metrics. And I mean, you, you can use the Euclidean distance, but uh, maybe the, uh, for example, if all the features would be binary, then we would rather use the what is the distance metric for binary vectors? Was it Hamming distance? Hamming distance, thank you. Yes, the Hamming distance, of course. Yes. So you could use different distance metrics. Yeah. Um, Yes, okay, and then, I mean, there is one problem which is not really easy to solve. It can be solved, and I, I, look, here we have, if we use just naively this distance metric, we may have a problem. Let's go back to here, yeah. Yeah, for example, if we just take these numeric values, for example, the price is in the range of some hundreds of euros. However, the size of the display is in the size of some inches. And now if we just use these numeric values, then of course the size of the display wouldn't play any role. Yeah? Because it's so small compared, and you even you even compute the square of the whole thing. So we would have something like 50,000 compared to nine. So you can just neglect the, di the display size. It does not work in this way. So what we need is, we have to scale these values. Yeah? And the simplest idea is just to normalize the values onto the interval uh, between zero and one. And I guess that's what we did. Yeah. Okay, um, that's okay. We just normalize all the values and then here we have feature values between zero and one. And this is of course much better. But now all the features, they are equally important. And this is not realistic. I mean, which feature would be the most important for such a camera? Oh, it depends on the customer. <laughs> it actually depends on the customer. Uh, yeah, but maybe the price is more important than the display size. Especially if it goes into the thousands of euros. Yeah? Um, so, now, in order to improve the whole thing, we would of course normalize our features and then we would introduce a weighting factor for all the features. So now the, the formula would look like that. So we would now have a weighted Euclidean distance. Euclidean distance. And now the question is, where do we get these weights from? And there are two answers. First is manually. Huh? We talk to some digital camera expert and would adjust these weights and then we would just run the system and maybe after some weeks 
it turns out that the weight for the price is too high and then we would manually adjust it a little bit and finally after years we would have a good uh, weight vector. Um, and of course um, this is not so nice. We would uh, of course like to have a faster optimization of this weight vector and therefore we would uh, have to use um, optimization algorithms for uh, optimizing this weight vector. Okay, and now let's talk about optimizing the weight vector. How could this be done? I'm not asking you for, for algorithms. Yeah? Suppose we have a good optimization algorithm. But before we talk about the details of the algorithm, um, we have to know what we want to optimize. What do we want to maximize or minimize? Here, that's the question. What would you say? I mean, we want to determine the weight vector such that question mark becomes minimal or maximal. What is our objective function to be maximized or minimized here? I mean, we can, we can just stop the lecture here and stop the semester and I give you this and I will ask you this as a first question in the oral exam. What would you think? I mean, in other words, I could also ask you um, what is the desired property of such a um, distance metric? Maybe we should look back to the user interface. <laughs> How could we improve the performance of the system by maybe modifying these weights. How should we modify the weights? Let's talk about manually modifying the weights. We just run this system. We have it, Marius implementation, and now we run it in the store, in the online store. And now who would, in, in what uh, case, uh, modify the weights? How would that process work if we do it manually? We ask the customer which feature is the most important for him. That might be uh, a way, yes. So every customer at the end, when he is finished, he would uh, have to fill in a little form where he rates the features. Yeah, and based on these ratings of the features, we might modify the weights. Yes, that may be possible, but I wouldn't do it if I would be the boss of this online store because for me this would be a little bit too embarrassing for the customers. Suppose, I mean, here we have only, I don't know, seven features. Um, Suppose you have uh, 35 features 
and every customer would have to fill in such a form about all the features. Um, yeah, the question is, wouldn't it uh, go easier? How about letting the customers um, finally look? Suppose I'm now the customer and that's what I get. And now the user interface just asks me, are you happy or are you not happy? I just give a, a five-star rating after this recommendation. So if I'm perfectly happy, I give it five stars, otherwise a uh, smaller number of stars. Um, and suppose for the moment to make it more easy, the, the feedback of the customer would just be binary. Was it good or was it bad? Huh? Um, and if the customer gives a bad rating, then this means we had a misclassification. Huh? This was the wrong product we recommended to this customer. If the customer returns a one, everything was perfect. Huh? And so based on such a rating, we could now um, try to minimize the number of misclassified recommendations. Huh? And of course we would have to collect, we would have to collect data from the customers. So maybe after 10,000 customers we have collected enough data and now we apply our optimization algorithm that modifies the weights such that the misclassifications on these 10,000 customers become smaller. That's the idea. Uh, so now we really enter the optimization business and we would have to use some optimization algorithm like gradient descent or like the pseudo inverse method. We will actually talk in the next or the last math lecture about the pseudo inverse method. Such methods could be used to uh, adjust the weights. But I, I don't go into the algorithms here. We will talk about these in the math lecture, maybe also next semester in math. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's uh, actually everything I have to say this semester in the AI lecture. Thank you very much for attending the lecture. And remember, please uh, give me the feedback. I mean, the inquiry is running now. Please give me feedback on this lecture. Um, yeah, thank you.